Okay, so the stream is ready. Uh, welcome back here at EHD, oh, EHSM. I should practice pronouncing the uh, conference I'm moderating. So, uh, welcome back here. We have now a talk on uh, so random number generation. Um, Ilya will not only teach us the basics of randomness, but also introduce a project to using uh, quantum mechanics to add random numbers. Um, one notice for all the people watching us in the stream, I heard these are like 200 people. Uh, you will get a slightly different version of the slides uh, without animations, so don't uh, be, be uh, confused when they look different than when we zoom out so you see the, the videos. So, please. Okay, hello everyone. So my name is Ilya Gerhard, and I think I was contacted by Sebastian since I did some uh, quantum hacking um, some years back. And um, yeah, I think let's say it was a very kind of um, spontaneous decision also to come here. I think it was con I was contacted in November. And I really like to thank uh, Sebastian, who was kind of the, the, the face for me uh, online uh, for this conference, and also all the organizers here. And I would like you to give them all an applause because I'm really, uh, I'm really very happy that they did this conference here. Okay, and I'm talking about, let's say, in the next uh, half hour, 40 minutes, a little bit about quantum randomness. And uh, actually, I stumbled into this topic more and more, and uh, I had to kind of uh, do some uh, kind of high school math, and I have to uh, apologize that I'm maybe not the perfect math person here to teach you. But, uh, but all of us has a, have a kind of intuitive uh, way to think about randomness. So the first thing is you think about randomness in gambling. So let's say we have these two dice there, everything is kind of straightforward and in principle they can produce a random number. So but if you already think about these two dice problem, so I just throw them and for example they ask you, uh, do you bet against a certain number if you are higher or lower? Uh, simply, it's, it's kind of straightforward that you have a number later, if you, if you add them up, between 2 and 12. That's what the outcome is. And um, so is it random? Is it a random number between 2 and 12? So I made this experiment, of course, in the computer. So this is uh, kind of a, the number of runs. So uh, we have about 5,000 times uh, kind of throwing the dice. And I see that sometimes there's a 2, 3, 4, and so on. So the, the normal way to kind of look if it's a random number or one approach is to say, well, we make a histogram of the results. So uh, of course, I have a certain number of uh, twos coming out. So this is simply one and one. And as well as uh, t uh, the outcome for 12 is simply six plus six. Uh, and it, this histogram, this behavior here, kind of reflects that, for example, for a certain number, for example, for the number of seven, we have more solutions or more kind of uh, valid, valid outcomes. So is it random? Okay, I think, I hope I answer this during the talk. So what is a random number anyway? So first of all, um, it's somehow something which is intuitively known, but which is something which is unpredictable. You cannot just say, well, the next number is such and such. You don't have a good way to to kind of predict the future for the outcome. So um, the main source of this randomness, this unpredictability here, is so-called entropy. This is the entropy, the, the kind of, the, the, this information resource in the system. So, and then a random number has no algorithmic, algorithmic process. And I will comment later on, uh, on this a little bit more in detail. Uh, namely on pseudonym random generation here. And then, as I think I opened the question already, so is a random number balanced? So does it mean, let's say, for example, if I toss a coin, do I get the same number of uh, heads and tails? Or is it just, or can it be even unbalanced? So I think that this cartoon also describes pretty nicely uh, something, some, some fundamentals of random numbers. So, of course, here you see the, this is a random number generator, the little, little beast up here, so, and it's spitting out a random number. So it's spitting out nine, 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 nine. So is it a random number? Yeah, well, you never know. You can never be sure. So this is something which I also had to learn the hard way, but I show you the, the entire, entire story about that. 
So random numbers are used, and let's say I think I already started with the first use, and the first use is of course gambling. Do you bet, for example, that I kind of throw the dice and you get more or less than seven? I don't know. Let's say this is one use, but I think there are more important use. For example, in math, uh, it's very important for simulations, and I, I will show you uh, something on the next slide where you use random numbers in a kind of large scale to approximate results. Then sampling, for example, you have to uh, kind of uh, get, uh, get people from uh, kind of to, to question, to make a survey. So then of course I can just basically kind of uh, get a telephone number and I will call you up randomly. And of course uh, if there's a big class of Monte, so-called Monte Carlo methods uh, where you use actually the properties of random numbers to sample out a certain, certain space. That's on the next slide. And then, yeah, for example, there is, there's a very old paper to use the die, dice for uh, statistical experiments here in the, in the 19th century. So, and then I think the really most important source or where you really need a lot of good and high quality random numbers is cryptography. And cryptography is really the, the third big uh, game there. So passwords, for example, if you cannot guess a password from a, from a, from a dictionary, it's an it's a increased security. But you also could use uh, passwords, which are, for example, secret keys in a public key cryptography. Then the ultimate uh, kind of uh, security re you reach with a so-called one-time pad. There, the key for the message to, to be encrypted is as long as a message, and you normally use an XOR to kind of flip all the bits of the message, and then you get a kind of, uh, kind of encrypted message out of there. So let's, let's recall also the, the importance of cryptography uh, and uh, it's random number to use, for example, with Netscape Navigator. So I think there was a bug in the 90s where you could predict which kind of random number was kind of chosen, and then the, it was a kind of a security leak. And I, I'm not too sure, but I think also in 2010 there was an OpenSSH bug which was also kind of uh, founding on the, on the properties of the random number generator and which, uh, on the random numbers which were used. So let's say a few th words I will say about the mass use of random numbers. And uh, there is a simple, simple way of determining uh, the, the number of uh, pi. Basically, you just uh, choose one random number from 0 to 1 here, another random number from 0 to 1 here, and then you simply draw a pixel on, the, on, on our observation space. So we know simply that the area here is 1 times 1, arbitrary values. So it's one. <laughs> and then, of course, uh, we have a whole circle, which is uh, pi r squared. So it's uh, r squared, uh, so it, which is also one. We know r is one here. So I simply can deduct, if I count the number of inner and outer dots I have here, and I can simply say, well, if they're inner or outer, wait, oh, just give me a second here. Opa. If if the kind of the vector pointing from inside to the rim here is larger one, larger than one or not. So this is the use of random numbers. Also, I have in this picture I have 50,000 pixels at the end, and so I see that uh, we know that pi is about 3.1415 something. So the more I do it, the closer I approximate to the to the uh, to the number of pi. So also this is pretty old, but this is a really uh, important use, uh, such methods for random numbers. So you can also read up on this, also in the 19th century, how to appro approximate pi with this method. So how to, how to get a random number? And this is not that easy as you might think of. Of course, the first thing everybody kind of comes up with is, um, tell me a number, and you just say something. And I think I ask several people, and I say, well, tell me a number between one and 100. And uh, <laughs> it's, interestingly, it's, uh, there, is, there, there was some research on that. So uh, how, to, how, to, how to, for example, get a random number out of human, human subjects. But I won't 
go into detail with this one. So basically, I will go into detail of two random number generators. And one is really the, the kind of software-based random number generator. And this is, of course, no random process which is in there. It's just a certain way of kind of writing an algorithm which gives out something like a random number. We will see it in a second, uh, how good these random numbers are. They can be pretty good. So I can even have a kind of so-called cryptographically secure random number generator in software. But this is uh, not that easy to build. And then there's an entire different class. And I also introduce one, uh, one which I built uh, in my labs, so to say, um, today of a hardware random number generator. And there can be really a lot of processes which you can use for random number generation. I think the most common or the most often used is, for example, mouse moves and collecting uh, keystrokes of a, on a keyboard and uh, to use this as a so-called seed for the pseudo-random number generator. Then there's something which is called true random number generators, where you use a, a kind of physical process which you consider to be a true random process. And mostly I will talk about uh, quantum random numbers today. So, and what this is. So let's first think a little bit about this kind of software-based. And uh, the first software-based random number generators were actually used uh, in, the, in the 50s of the last century. Uh, and this is the ENIAC. Uh, it's, a, it's one of the big uh, computers which were built uh, during the Second World War. And uh, John from Neumann actually invented a procedure. And he said, yeah, well, let's get it some random numbers into there. Uh, let's start, for example, with a number. Let's say this is the seed which I put into the random number machine. Let's square this random number so I have a leading zero here. Let's take the inner digits. Let's square this again. And again, there's a leading zero here. And take the inner digits again, so you see that this is simply seven, three, two, one. And in principle, you go on and on and on. So this gives you a good random number to a certain extent. So let's have a closer look how good these random numbers are. So this is a start. So um, as I said, we know the first two numbers. So I just go on and on and on. And let's say we go on until, let's say, 140. But from a certain point on, there's something funny going on. Somehow there's a repetitive pattern. So this was, I think this was maybe the first uh, software-based uh, random number generator. So you have a kind of repetitive uh, kind of sequence which is going, going on. So this, is, this really shows the, the typical problems of the software-generated random number. And first of all, there is the, the, the danger is always that there is a periodic outcome. Then, for example, there could also be a correlation between uh, subsequent numbers. So you could, for example, imagine that if the number is very, very large, that the next number will be for sure very, very small. So, and let's say at least to a certain extent of this randomness, and I go into details a little later, um, you have to imagine that we expect from a random number that it's kind of white, which means that it's equally distributed of, uh, among all the numbers, which could come out, yeah, for example, more, more higher numbers than lower could be a problem. And so I should basically draw a histogram of this one, and then we find out how well this is. So, and if I think about these pseudo-random number generators, I always think about such things uh, as uh, uh, Fred Flintstone and Barney um, kind of driving through the, kind of, uh, through the landscape and you always see the same houses flying by and the same rocks. Let's say, I think if you, if you carefully watch the cartoons, you see the same, same, same again and again and again, although it appears random at the first place. So, John von, John von Neumann actually came up then with a sentence here, anyone who considers an arithmetic method of producing a random digit is, of course, in a state of sin. So there's no real, real random number to be generated with a, a pseudo-random number generator. And there's another saying, or the, a citation here, the generation of random numbers is too important to be left to chance. I think also this is pretty neat. 
So let's let's think about hardware now. Let's think about uh, hardware which which can be used uh, to uh, to get random numbers. I think the hardware I already introduced. So in principle, you can toss a coin, you can roll a dice, you can use a roulette, roulette. You can uh, have a lottery machine, and to a certain extent, there is something in there which will give you a random outcome. Let's say, I think there were kind of, uh, I think uh, quite some people know how to roll the dice very well, and other people know how to kind of manipulate lottery machines, uh, since, uh, um, to, for example, to favor one or the other outcome. And so this is not real, the elementary process of randomness. There are a lot of input parameters. For example, if you know the inertia of the of the dice, if you know exactly how it was kind of thrown and then it kind of turns or the roughness of the surface, a lot of parameters go in there and look, there is a physical process which is pretty deterministic to come out to a certain point that there is a certain number to be thrown. But there are physical phenomena which are really kind of more elementary to uh, to randomness. And uh, I basically list a few of them here, and I go into further details over some of them. So Johnson noise, this is basically the, joy, uh, the noise on a, on, a, on a resistor, can be kind of amplified. Simply Brownian motion, for example, diffusion of particles, if you monitor them on a camera, you see basically they fulfill such a thing which is called a random walk. But also this depends, of course, on certain input parameters. Then there was a lot of uh, kind of experiments also in the 60s, 70s with uh, radioactive sources, um, uh, also with random number generation. And then we come more into the quantum world. We come more into the kind of um, counting, counting events uh, from photons, for example, which is, for example, the shot noise. The shot noise is something which occurs if you, if you have a certain number of events and count them. And then there's two things, basically I will kind of go into detail here. One is photons and their decision at the beam splitter. So let's say there's a photon and something is in the way and then you have two clicks at the outcome. I will show it in a second. And then there are even niftier uh, things like entanglement, but I think I only go very roughly into the details of that. So this is basically kind of uh, covering the next part of the talk here. So quantum mechanics, quantum mechanics is uh, also, let's say, really something which is really fancy, especially for uh, randomness here. So the nice point about a quantum mechanical state is that it cannot only be in a, in a ground or an excited state. The system can be really, and this is a real state of the system, be in a so-called superposition state. And uh, you could say, well, the, the state, for example, of an atom or of a photon or of a really kind of elementary particle, so to say, can be partially comp composed of something which is in the ground state and something which is in the excited state. This is very important, and I introduce some of this a little later. Then for the kind of more fancy stuff, you can also have a so-called entangled state, where you have actually two particles, and they share a kind of interesting property, which is called entanglement. So which means that one is basically in the, in the ground state, and then in the very same moment, the other is in the excited state, or vice versa. So you can have it, or this is this, or and that state. So if you, if you for example, measure particle RA here in, in the ground state, you know that particle B is in the excited state. So it's very hard to imagine that this is kind of holds for atoms and, and photons but uh, which is kind of more kind of intuitive for, for a lot of people, is uh, actually a polarization. So what do I do? I take, a, I take a beam, and in principle it can be something like this laser beam, for example, and I have it prepared in such a way that it has a certain polarization. So it goes in at a 45 degree angle onto this so-called polarizing beam splitter. So if I have my polarizing beam splitter analyzing only the outcomes, if it's polarized uh, kind of horizontally or vertically, uh, then it's kind of clear that this 45 degrees input will be either kind of, for each photon basically will either click on this detector or it will produce a click on that detector. 
So this is either or. So the photon, the kind of elementary particle of light, cannot be split into two parts. And um, yeah, I think this is roughly the, the meaning also. Here we have a kind of superposition state in, in both. So the, the kind of linear polarization in 45 degrees is a kind of superposition of these two outcomes here. So and for the random number generation, I simply can say, well, this is one and this is zero. For the next photon again, this is one, this is zero. If it clicks, it clicks either here or there. So if you look through the last 15, 15 years roughly of quantum randomness, there are always two ways. So how do you get a quantum random number and the first way is really to take a beam splitter. It doesn't need to be a polarizing beam splitter. You have a photon, or even a stream of photons. You have a one detector, and you have a zero detector. So, and then you see, well, if this clicks, I write a one, and if this clicks, I write a zero. The other way is simply to take a kind of a single detector and to have subsequent timing events. So, how do I, what do I see, basically? I see kind of my time is kind of evolving here. And every now and then I get a click, one after the other. And the interesting point is I normally measure the arrival times of the photons. So, and then I, in this case, I kind of measure the time difference between these two, and I measure the time difference between these two. And I simply have two outcomes. Either uh, one is kind of larger than the other, then I write down a zero, or I do it vice versa, then I take a one as the outcome. And these are kind of two fundamental principles which are working in, I would say, in almost all quantum random number generators out there. I show you two pa uh, pictures of other papers which do it differently, but this is r kind of the bottom line how this actually works. So you can even buy such a thing. So this is uh, from ID Quantique from Genoa. And um, this is a so-called quantum random number generator. It's basically, it's a, it's a LED, a beam splitter, and uh, two detectors. And then I think something odd is made. Namely, they put this number through a hash function. Uh, but I, I will talk about randomness extraction in a minute. OK, I think this device is about 1,000 euro. And um, then you get this PCI Express card, which gives you, at a certain rate, I think it's four, four megabit of random digits out there. So these are two other papers, just what people are doing. And I think I really would highlight this one. This is, uh, I think, a very, very nice uh, paper on quantum randomness as well. So it's uh, from Stephen Peronio, who's now at, uh, I think, in, uh, in Bra uh, not in Brussels, he's in Belgium at least. Um, and there they make a, me a certain measurement on, on a so-called belt state, a loophole free in a certain way, and uh, this is a very good paper. And then there's also, uh, there are not so uh, kind of uh, thrilling papers to me uh, where they basically kind of measure continuo vari continuous variable uh, uh, properties of a, of a vacuum state. But Again, so let's say what is kind of common for a lot of these random number generators is uh, that you have a detector which actually clicks and gives you out a bit. So, and of course, this can also uh, give out some, some click if there was no photon. So there's a certain problem of dark counts. And yeah, and also this device is pretty pricey. So this is really something which is which is often used in, in quantum optics. So this is about 5,000 euro. This is a little bit of a headache if you, if you want to build something on your own. So um, I had some other ideas, and I would like to introduce these ideas. And my idea started basically off a webcam, and um, everything was kind of straightforward. I got this from uh, eBay in North America, so it was, I think, $3.50, including shipping, of course. Um, and it was OK. So in this webcam, I kind of took apart and kind of disassembled everything here. So uh, here you see basically the, the inner, inner webcam. I removed the glass here 
from, from the webcam itself. And um, then I bought something else from, from eBay, namely uh, some radioactive sauce. And uh, if you if you carefully look, I'm not too sure if you can see it, uh, there is um, there's 0.9 microcurry of americium 241 in there. And this was pretty nice because now I, if I combine these two things, I have a detector which gives me a click really where I see quantized events from a radioactive source because these are alpha particles which are emitted. And if I put everything together, it basically looks like this. So this is a bare CCD chip and each of the alpha decays here made, makes an impact on the on the CCD chip itself. So it's a little bit like the, like the semiconductor detector which was introduced this morning. Uh, it's not germanium, it's not something pricey. I think the entire device is about uh, five to 10 US dollars. And uh, yeah, that's about it. So I think I put everything together. Uh, so this is basically the, the webcam itself. Then I kind of uh, broke off a smoke detector, smoke alarm to take out the radioactive source and put it onto the onto the CCD chip. You have to be very careful because uh, this high energy impact of uh, alpha, of he helium nuclei, onto the electronics also uh, um, makes the webcam crash every now and then. So I took nail polish and carefully covered all the parts which are not uh, really photosensitive, but which are kind of processing and uh, other electronics on the, on the, on the dye itself. So, what do we get out there? So we have uh, this webcam, this is uh, super low resolution, it's uh, 240 by 320 pixels, and we have about uh, eight frames per second, and we get always kind of an impact there. And this is a movie, and I recorded this movie, I think, two days ago, and I think we eventually have a chance also to, uh, to, uh, to kind of play around with this device a little later in one or the other frame here. So you see that these are really alpha particles hitting uh, the, the bare CCD chip. And now I have a lot of ways to interpret this uh, in terms of a quantum mechanical, quantum, uh, quantum random number generator, so to say. So now I have to realize that for each of the pixels, I have a certain impact and I can treat each pixel itself as a Geiger counter. And I can say, well, what is the timing between, between two uh, kind of uh, subsequent events or three subsequent events for one pixel. So this is the interpretation as a kind of a highly parallelized uh, Geiger counter. Then I can also interpret this device in the moment I say, well, where is the impact of my particles? In principle, I can simply say, just for the kind of the easy way, I just divide this, this movie into two uh, sides. And if there are more on the right-hand side, I say zero, if there are more on the left-hand side, I say one, for example. This, is, this would be a kind of simple way also to treat the location information in terms of a single mode as a quantum random generator. So I wrote a software for this. I read, this is not part of the talk. I will show it right uh, after the talk. So first of all, it's clear that this image contains randomness. These are kind of stochastic events from a radioactive source. So how do you extract randomness of, out of such a source? And this is not, not a very easy task. And I, a lot of people, uh, also in quantum randomness, just say, well, we know that there is quantum randomness. That's enough. Or we say we take a so-called cryptographic hash function. So I'm not sure if everybody knows what a cryptographic hash function is. It's a function where you kind of give a certain input and then you get a certain output. So this is a hash function. Cryptographic means if I flip one bit at the input, the outcome is significantly different. So if I flip another bit, it's also significantly different. So it's really a kind of unpredictable outcome for a certain thing. So in principle, I can take image one, image two, and I can do it for all other images, so to say. And I can just say, well, my, my number of bits, which is in the image, is kind of long enough. I can, I can just treat this as a, as a random number. So this is uh, SHA256 uh, 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 
uh, just f f of image one and image two. But if you carefully look through the math, uh, you, it's just not proven that a hash function does what it's supposed to do, do in this case. And uh, for example, I really like to cite this uh, from Young malicious cryptography here. So um, let me highlight two things here. Uh, SHA uh, was not designed to output random looking hash values and it was not designed to extract truly random bits from inputs with, with a sufficient amount of entropy. So a hash function is simply not a randomness extractor. So we can also say, well, the use of SSH one or two to extract 160 random bits from the collected entropy strings is hilarious since there is no evidence to suggest that the SHA1 function does to in fact do this. This use of SHA1 assumes that it's a magic box that can magically extract the entropy from the input string and outputs a truly random 160 bits. So we really have to be careful and this is something which, I'm, which is really currently work in progress uh, where we try to extract the randomness in a way where we do not do some oddity, I would say. So, when we have all these images, as I said already, so first of all, we have a, a certain number of locations. I can say, well, for example, on the right-hand side, there is more than on the left-hand side. I will show you something. And another thing is also, I can uh, kind of just get out the center of mass. Then, I can analyze the kind of highly parallel Geiger counters on my device, which I have there. And again, I can uh, analyze on the location. So, and this is closely related to this problem, how many, how much entropy is in one of these images to uh, image compression and uh, compression of movies. Because all the entropy in there is basically the, the, the lowest compression option or the highest compression option of these images. This basically preserves all my entropy which is in the images. This is just the image of one impact, so I can uh, strictly determine these. So uh, if, I, if I take all these images, I have built quite some of these uh, random number generators. I have uh, written a, a software in Python and to locate all these things. And um, later on, you see if you add up all these images, you see that there's a certain distribution of pixels and already this is uh, introducing some headache how to how to get the randomness out of there because they are so-called hot pixels and they are so-called dead pixels that's also clear pretty straightforward from a, from a digital camera so if you look on the distribution of hot and dead pixels um, you basically see that this is a kind of a, a curve wait uh, no this is this is now a kind of a list. I have, let's say, for example, image number uh, 518, and it has a certain timing. It has a minimum uh, pixel uh, kind of uh, gray value, the maximum pixel gray value, a certain mean, a center of maximum in X and in Y, and um, then I kind of have other kind of quality values. So, for example, from, the, from this image, I took 16 events, and from this, I took 20 events. So the center of mass is pretty something where I kind of balance out where my impacts were. So, um, and then I also have all these kind of random numbers. So these are my impacts. These are my impact pixels here and my impact pixels here. So this is the, the bottom line of information in such images. So, yeah, this is again the kind of the, the distribution of pixels, hot and uh, dead pixels. And this is actually with the curve I meant. So we see that there are, if, let's say, roughly these are kind of 80,000 pixels, these uh, uh, 320 by 240. And there are a few pixels which never light up, so I call them dead pixels. There are a few pixel, pixels which are very, very bright. And then now you have to think about an algorithm, how to choose for example, for each pixel, a certain random number with a certain uh, kind of bit length. And this is a already pretty hard problem. So in principle, it's related to the knapsack problem where you put everything into a backpack and try to get uh, it filled as good as possible. It's not that easy to, to get this, uh, to really kind of associate, for example, bits to a certain impact position on this device. 
So then there's also something which is uh, with the frame rate. Of course, it's a, it's a super uh, kind of low speed device. It's highly parallelized, but parallelized, but it's very low speed. So this is 160 milliseconds uh, per image. So this is a, a little less than 10, uh, 10 images per second. And sometimes there are really long waiting times. For example, this could be introduced by my software. I'm not exactly sure uh, where this comes from. So I did this analysis in a pretty rough way. First of all, for the center of mass. So this is the center of mass of the, of the impact. So this is a kind of Gaussian distribution here. So if I just make a kind of a histogram in X and Y, this is basically how it looks like. So, and in principle, I can associate to each of these pixels a certain random value. And I could also say, well, I just make them that they are equal. I can just say, for example, I can just say, well, I half this into two, and I call this side zero, and I call the other side one, and from the other side, I also do the same here. But I can also just divide it into equal area parts, which are equal probable, so I can say, this is zero, zero, one, one, zero, one, and one, zero, just uh, as four parts, I can split such a, such a thing in. Uh, I think this is uh, I think this is pixels where where the where the this is center of mass. So I think uh, you see that one is about 120 here, and the other one is 180. So let's have a look here. So this is 120 here, or this is the other center of mass. So this is basically if I do a slice, and I, if I just just put them into into a histogram. I can also put them into a histogram, just uh, just time wise. Uh, this is, for example, just uh, where how they are distributed. This is this is timing. This is frames, 50,000 frames. You see, in the beginning, by the way, uh, the I have to discard the first images since the camera do, does some uh, auto calibration and tries to kind of adapt the, uh, the 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 level. So, the random numbers <laughs> I extracted out of the device is are these. So. Um, I think there is some pixel interference, so it doesn't really look so uh, overwhelming. But to me, it looks pretty random. <laughs> but it's very hard to tell. So do I have a good random number generator? Maybe. So let's say I try to address another um, problem first. And uh, we have to think about this. I was, I was at the very beginning, I was uh, kind of throwing these two dice. And then I said, hey, well, if I have something which is, uh, which is not balanced, let's say, where I don't have kind of uh, six, for example, if I only have one dice, is it, is it really a random number? Yeah, well, <laughs> let's say, I think this is still under discussion, so to say, you can say, well, yes, this, this is a random number, but for sure, if, for example, also if you have a biased coin, it contains some entropy. So even if you have a biased coin, which, which kind of lands on 90% uh, on, on the head and not on the tail, you would say, well, uh, this is, I, I can bet against this, and I know that there's a certain probability to get head against tail. But uh, there's, a, uh, there's a very interesting uh, property here, what you can use. You can only count the bit flips, which basically means that in the moment you, you only look uh, on two events, and if it hail, uh, head uh, on one moment and tail on the other moment, you say this is one, and vice versa, this is zero. And then you get the entropy out of the system, and um, and this is exactly here and here. So this reduces the number of random bits you can take out of the uh, out of the kind of tossed coin significantly, but it's balanced from a kind of intrinsically point. You can even iterate this procedure. So this is then called the multi-level strategy. Uh, there's a paper I think in the 80s by Yuva Perez. And I think this is very, uh, very nice where the, he describes how to, how to kind of toss a coin and how to extract the most, uh, the, 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 the most of bits out of there. So there's more entropy in there, just it's not only on the bit flips. So testing randomness, and I have just shown you the, the wonderful uh, kind of uh, display here with my random numbers generated from the uh, random number generator. And uh, I was asking you, hey, is this a random number or not? So here, again, two numbers, or actually two bit strings. 
And uh, yeah, give me a second. So, so the first one is not such a good random number, I would say. At least, of course, it could be part of a random number, as the kind of comic strip in the beginning was showing. But the second one looks like more distributed. So, of course, maybe maybe the first one is just a bad random number, and the other one is a good random number. So it's already another classification of random numbers which um, gives me some headache, but the second one isn't a random number. It's just a binary expansion of pi, so, <laughs> so in principle, you just, you just have, a, have a kind of representation, and this is pi is definitely not a random number. It's pi, it's, there's, a, there's a way to determine this number. So we had this property of balancing, so if I really use this multi-level strategy and I extract something out there, in principle there should be as many zeros as ones for a certain, certain point. Then there's a property which, I, uh, which is called binary entropy, and uh, this is defined by Claude Shannon, and this is a little bit nifty. I don't go into details here, but in principle you can uh, see uh, what the binary entropy of a random bit string is. And for example, if, if there are so and so many people in this room, we could just, for example, check if we are kind of <laughs> randomly distributed. So in principle, it's clear that this birthday spacing property uh, is something which you also can apply to a, a binary string. So in principle, there should be as many 1100s in there as, for example, 1010s. This is something which, you, which is a statistic property that this is equally distributed. And of course, as I said, uh, the kind of image processing is strongly related to the compressibility of a, of a random number. So how do you check actually? So first of all, you can really kind of visualize it. So for example, this von Neumann uh, random number generator was pretty uh, not robust against uh, your visual check, I guess then again, you can check the balancing, the binary entropy, and the birthday spacing. And there are a few test suites on the internet which actually do these things. For example, there's a ENT, I think this is apt-get install ENT for many Unix systems. And then there's a diehard and the NIST suite, and then basically there's a, I would say, the recent and most complete suite from test U1 uh, from Montreal. So um, normally what you get out there, for example, I implemented the NIST suite and you can download it on my webpage uh, for Mathematica and for Python. Uh, you get a certain, certain uh, probability out there if a random number is a random number or not. So and this is, for example, a kind of uh, testing on the 10 to the 6 first uh, binary digits on, of pi. And uh, it looks like pi would be a random number. So this is roughly a summary of what I've shown. So this is basically randomness and its use. Then the kind of true or the hardware generated randomness versus a pseudo random number generator here. The kind of basic fundamental working principle of uh, quantum random number generators. And a very simple quantum random number generator which has a few interesting properties where I think, in, especially in the math, there's a lot of things to be explored and a little bit on the, on the kind of outlook on testing randomness. So thanks for your attention, first of all. So I have, uh, first of all, not only to thank the organizers here, but also to Timo Hanke, who is kind of the mathematician on the back. My profession is more quantum optics. And uh, so I have these random number generators with me, so the two of them, so to say. And I think, uh, let's say, if time allows, I will simply test them. I will show you the Python software and the, uh, the binary strings which are coming out. And thank you so far. So there are roughly 20 minutes left of the time slot. So you could do some live demo if you want. I can. I can do a live, live demo right now. I think that's a, that's a decent idea. So let's plug in one of the devices. I hope it works kind of uh, as advertised. So sorry for the people in the stream, they will only get a filmed image of the big screen. So let's, let's open this one. So I have, uh, instead of the lens, I have um, uh, 
uh, kind of the, the, the radioactive source uh, to screw on there. So let's give it a try to plug it in. I, let's say I realized that it not always works, so there's a light. Let's, let's have a look, and I think I just open a whatever software here to see if this is, no, this is, <laughs> that's, not the, that's not the right stream. Let's have a look. I think there's another camera. And um, yeah, this is actually the camera I'm, I'm kind of uh, working with. I can cover this, and you can, you can simply see the, the bare CCD chip reacting to the light. And um, now I'm coming with a radioactive source, so there's no light anymore. I simply, it's an alpha source, so I basically take off the, the little sticker which was on there, which is basically blocking all the alpha radiation. So and uh, let me uh, kind of um, <coughs> put this in here. So you re already see the, the kind of random number generated. Uh, actually, this is basically an image with a lot of entropy in there. So even so, you see that I'm screwing it in, and it's getting more and more and more and more. Uh, it, this is exactly the law we learned this morning. It's one over r squared. Uh, how the how this behavior is on the radiation impact. So I have a lot of software on this. Uh, let me try to do it with one hand. Um, Science projects, true number generation, procs, the modular one. Uh, let's have a look what's in here. Um, and I think this is called like that. So in principle, uh, it's, it's, it's again the wrong camera. It's, I'm, I'm very sorry for that. Um, uh, so you, you, we have to set a certain number of things there. First of all, I have to drop all the, f uh, the starting frames since there's this kind of uh, camera auto scale in there. So um, I choose the other camera now. So this is camera one. And in principle, it should just work right away. Uh, let's hope, yeah. So you see basically that I capture um, all the events um, and basically kind of uh, find the center of mass of each uh, then there is the center of mass of all the pixels together, which is the rest, red crosshair. And in the end, uh, I th simply can go here. And uh, let's let's look with midnight commander. Uh, so there's uh, there's there are some random strings. So this is basically random numbers generated. I hope this uh, this is actually looks random. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not too sure, I haven't tested it in a while, if this is really random. Um, so this was a really very, very short demo here, uh, what's, what's in there. And then there are, of course, some kind of s sample images, which I take every now and then. Some of the pixels are discarded, for example, if they are very, very uh, at the rim, very close to the rim here, for example, this one, or if they are very weak. So I, I set a certain threshold from when uh, uh, kind of a pixel is considered to be a kind of uh, a hot pixel or a kind of a, a pixel with, with impact on there. So let's have a look. What else do I collect here? So I save the programs for, sh for the safety. And principle, yeah, this, there, there's a lot of uh, kind of statistical uh, data, uh, the timestamps, for example, uh, the image statistics, but this is only 100 images was what I was collecting. So I think um, I would kind of stop the uh, demonstration here. Um, wait, uh, basically with a running random number generator, I think we can discuss this in further glory. Let's modify here a little bit the max number of acquired images. Let's make some more here. And yeah, I hope there are questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you mentioned pi, which is not random. so. Uh, I think it's related to the Kolmogorov complexity. So you did not mention it. Uh, you you had no time, maybe. <laughs> let, let me phrase it this way. I think it's uh, let's to the best of my knowledge, uh, pi is let's say it's still under discussion if it's a normal number or not. I hope this is the right English term for that. So can you find all? 
uh, arbitrary long random strings in the uh, digits of pi or not. I think this is still an unknown thing, and so uh, in principle you kind, of, uh, you kind of mentioned the complexity in there, that's totally correct, but I wasn't really kind of uh, going into the depths here. My, my kind of profession is quantum optics, and I know that this is quantized events, and I principally can say that if I have a certain mode, um, kind of a distribution of a kind of a, a kind of a wave, so to say, wave-like particle, over an area, for example, on this webcam, I can treat this as a kind of a superposition uh, of events in this entire mode. And this is basically the kind of the bottom line, also which kind of is the quantum mechanics part in there. Oh, I see one more question. Are there more questions? So I know where to go afterwards, okay. Well, as far as I understood it, a uh, cryptographical hash basically extracts entropy from any sources you put into it. So then I'm wondering why do you, couldn't you basically use any input into the webcam and extract the entropy from it, like point a webcam at a street? Are you sure you can do that? Uh, let's say again, I, I like to underline that the, the hash function as a randomness extractor is just not characterized well. So you can say, well, of course, I can. In principle, you can you can use any, even I would say, deterministic process to a certain extent at least, uh, and put it into a uh, into a hash function. And let's say, for example, the, the let's say you you can even think about a Mersenne twister or something really a good random number generator in in software, uh, which which has same properties, so to say. You can you can there are also lava lamp. Uh, quantum random or lava lamp random number generators. In principle, you can do that. But the, the fundamental point is you could theoretically, if you have all input parameters, predict in a deterministic description of the entire physical process what the outcome will be. Let's say if I toss a coin, in principle, I can kind of describe everything. In quantum mechanics, I can have such a thing as a superposition state, and this is the key element in the moment I say, well, I want to have true randomness. Uh, it's, it's nothing kind of uh, outstanding to have kind of a block vector, for example, in a superposition between an excited and a ground state. I can just prepare the state, and then I can do a measurement, and this measurement will be clear if I have a superposition state, kind of uh, where the probabilities is equal, uh, are equal, I will have 50% outcome one and 50% outcome zero, and this is not a—it's not a coin toss. It's not—it's not like I cannot. There is no um, how to say. There is no uh, background knowledge. I can predict the next outcome. Hi, um, I'm I'm thinking that um, there's a lot of different, uh, lot of uh, a lot of hits in each frame that you have there. And uh, I mean, if you would have a longer time period for, for the frames, you would eventually get up to the point where there would be more, like there would be a rare thing to have blue, uh, to have a black pixels in there. So, sure. so at some point you would have like the optimal amount of, of, do of uh, hits. I fully agree. Let's say, I, I really have to say that um, uh, the nice point of this device, it's actually not that it's uh, cheap or neat or nifty or something you can do on your own. The nice point is that you intrinsically combine the two approaches in quantum randomness. Uh, so you have some mode information. You can say, well, I know the mode, basically, of all the kind of events impacting on the camera. I can say, for example, this is my mode as a kind of wave description of these particles. And the other thing is I can treat them as Geiger counters independently, one after the other. There could be such a thing that everything is black and I could not uh, kind of extract anything. In principle, this is totally feasible, yeah. So how, how, how large a uh, uh, random number can you uh, rely that you <laughs> I, I can have to, out? I have to admit, we haven't done the math to the, to the full end. It's, uh, it's, let's, say we, let's say in principle you can calculate the binary entropy of the end, on the entire image, but we were uh, not, let's say the, the problem is that you have, let's say the, the real headache comes in if you have, for example, a changing frame rate. 
if you have uh, kind of uh, hot or dead pixels uh, with a certain probability. And uh, let's say to the, to the very bottom line, we were not uh, coming through. So I think this is one of my next projects there to really kind of know how much entropy is in there and how should you treat this? Should you treat this as independent Geiger counters or should you treat this as to saying, well, the left side is one, uh, the right side is zero, or saying, well, this is zero, zero, the upper uh, quadrant here is one, 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 zero, zero, one, and uh, we haven't come to the final end. But this is, uh, it's, it's, it's a nice uh, kind of uh, interdisciplinary thing, so to say. Uh, just regarding the, the, the center of mass that you showed before, it, it, would, it would strike me that it, it, it would be um, unwise to just take um, either quadrants or either take the left or the right, split it right down the middle, given the fact that the isotopic um, radiation itself, you can't rely that it's perpendicular to the tangent at the center of the CCD. So you might want to maybe take a diagonal sample through it and then count the number of you know, across some sort of diagonal sample across like that. That's, so that that's totally true. I, I just uh, screwed it in, and in principle, it can be off center, it can be tilted or whatever. You're totally true, it's totally right. But the point is uh, that it was just for demonstration here. So we did uh, kind of distance dependence, of course, and we, we carefully kind of aligned the, the source. That's true. Another question is uh, Does right, this kind of radioactivity damage uh, in the long run the CCD sensor? Yes, <laughs> let's say, <clears throat> I, I think it's hard to see up there, but, but you see that after and after, uh, the impact of alpha particles on this CCD camera damages the pixel, so it's getting brighter and brighter. That's indeed true, and, uh, but uh, in principle, uh, the idea is to take older and older webcams, which have larger and larger pixels, which actually can withstand such a thing. So uh, this is, uh, let's say, uh, this is our way to kind of to, to get to this point. But in principle, uh, for these webcams, it's true. It's even hard to get a webcam where you can remove the glass nowadays. Now, normally, everything is kind of directly shielded under under a kind of acrylic glass or something which is which is uh, kind of uh, totally covered. And uh, this was pretty nice to get for 350 a few webcams. Which uh, actually, the the glass was so crappy glued on the on the chip, I could just simply remove it with a tweezer. Yeah. Uh, have you tried using the thermal noise of the pixels? What? The thermal noise of the pixels. The thermal noise of the pixels. Yeah. Let's say again with the thermal noise here. Um, the nice thing about let's say I thought about that. To, let's say, but but this is strictly non non quantum, so to say. Um, let's say we know that we have a certain energy distribution um, of uh, of the alpha particles hitting the hitting the uh, the CCD chip. Uh, we have a certain kind of a distribution of um, uh, of of intensities, which also uh, kind of. Uh, is, is strongly dependent on the fact that sometimes you hit the pixel is exactly in the center, sometimes a little bit off. Um, and the point was really to get quantized events, something which clicks, so to say, and for in a, in a much cheaper way than, for example, one of these uh, APDs or these Avalanche photodiodes which I was showing, which uh, simply cost 5,000 euro. So um, in principle, you can use this, that's true, but I really would like to to have, so to say, no, um, no dark counts, no, uh, no kind of, I don't want to use this analog information which is uh, dependent on other parameters but the pure radioactive decay. Okay, so as I don't see any more questions, thank you for your talk. Um, we will continue in 50 minutes with the usage of uh, open hardware at the CERN. Thank you.